All right, so at this point, we've got our plugin installed. And now what we're going to do is take a look at what do we have? What features did we get out of the box? My handout here gives us an overview that now we actually have new menu items. So the, the great thing about uh, plugins is that they give us new features. The bad thing is that there's no consensus on how to give us those features. No consensus between the different developers of plugins, that is. Because some developers might say, okay, we're going to add our features in our own unique menu item. Some developers put your features in another existing one. So for example, on our site, we have a brand new and obvious link called Products. But that's only one of the new screens and features that we get from this plugin. Products. We'll look at it, of course, but we have our own item products. And we saw that with Duplicator. Duplicator added its own menu item as well. Sometimes you get, you get items from a plugin that are tucked away in the settings menu. And as a matter of fact, WP Commerce also does that. Under settings, we have a brand new item, store. That was not there before. So we might have a top level menu item, and we might also have an item in the settings. Furthermore, we could have sometimes options in tools. This one doesn't, but I see sometimes that a plugin puts it into tools. And um, I also see it that sometimes a plugin adds itself to the dashboard, like this one store upgrades and store sales. So this is what I'm saying about there's no consensus. There's no like design guide that says always uh, plugin authors always put your plugin features here. There's no official, well, there might be an official one, but everyone seems to ignore it. So when you install a brand new plugin, you'll always be able to find it back here under plugins, install plugins. Hopefully there's some description, and then the plugin will tell you, don't forget to click on this item over here. Or the plugin itself might have settings right on the plugin. And so my handout here explains all the features that this plugin gave us, but not everyone is is like this. Some are easier, some are more complicated. So we got WP Commerce there. My handout says, um, let's see, in dashboard you've got store upgrades and store sales. The first is if you want to pay for plugins, which are not necessary, and the second shows you who bought products. So let's do this. Wherever we're at, go ahead and click on the dashboard button on the top left corner go to dashboard and we're gonna see something new here uh, we're gonna see a couple of little boxes sales by quarter sales by month so when we log in for the first time into our WordPress we will see this dashboard which we can customize so actually I want to customize this you can drag and drop these boxes uh, well first of all I don't need this welcome you can close it if you want to, but I'm going to close it just because we're doing a few more advanced things than what it's telling us here. Uh, but this Welcome to WordPress, I'm just going to close it. And this WP eCommerce News, I'm going to close that too. I don't want to really look at that. And this WordPress News down here, okay, I want to close that. So you can close these things, you can drag and drop, you can move this activity to the right column, right here. So this is the first thing you see, and maybe the first thing I want to see when I log in is all the money I made. You can do that in there. What you can also do is, um, we've mentioned this before uh, last month, but we'll mention it again. Pretty much every screen that we look at in WordPress most likely has extra features that are not even visible. So let's look under Screen Options. There's a lot of things we can do in WordPress, so many options are, are hidden. So let's go to Screen Options. Uh, for example, I close that welcome item. We can bring it back if we want. Actually, I don't want to look at the WordPress news. Close that. I don't want to look at the e-commerce news. Close that. I don't want to look at whatever. You can turn things on or off, but I'm uh, kind of keeping it simple. Sales and activity as my topmost items. Doesn't matter how you do it, but that's how I'll put mine. And I'll close the screen options just to give me space here. 
So we see this under the dashboard home. And with under, with un, under dashboard, we've got store upgrades and sales. Let's take a look at store upgrades. They should name that link a little better, more like WP upgrades. These are the upgrades for the WP Commerce plugin. So, for example, we've got something called Member Access plugin. If I want people to be able to log in and have their own member screen and all that cool stuff, there's a plugin. It's sort of like a sub plugin to your main plugin, WP Commerce. And it's telling me there's a bunch of interesting plugins here that I might want, like Gold Cart. So this is product search, multiple image upload, payment gateways and such. Okay, interesting. How much does it cost? Let's say I click on Member Access Plugin. Members and Subscriptions, $99. So the is one that that's... One-time fee? One-time fee, yes. So the built-in member system, the system that's on WordPress built in is okay, but this ones are much better, have more features. But obviously, the question was how do they make their money? This is how they make their money, extra features. It's $99 one time fee, which, you know, depending what you what you sell, that might not be a big investment. It may give you, it may pay for itself relatively quickly. Okay, so that's one item. Uh, what else do we have here? The gold cart. Our most popular extension features gold, grid view, multiple product images, product gallery view, live product search, one support token. <coughs> so we can do that. We just different layouts, different product layouts. We can have this more advanced demo, product demo. We can have a search, we can have a live search of products. We have the built-in WordPress search, but this is more focused on products. Gold cart. Payment gateways. We're going to see that in this class we're going to talk about one of the most uh, well-known and powerful uh, payment gateways, which is a way to collect our money. We're going to be able to make a full-featured cart, then we need to collect money. We're going to use PayPal. It's not the only company out there that processes payments. It's one of the biggest ones, one of the oldest ones. But there's other ones that we can use, such as, I guess, BluePay and SagePay and Authorize.net, that's a big one. WP Commerce, out of the box, doesn't support these payment gateways. But in this class, we're going to learn and we're going to set up a PayPal account. It's free. And PayPal will charge you processing fees. But guess what? They all charge you processing fees. There's always a middleman charging you something when it comes to money. And so you might, you might think, well, I want to use Virtual Merchant. Great. We would need to look up how much their fees are because they're all going to charge you fees. With a huge range of fees structures, it could be half a percentage point per transaction. It could be you know, a flat rate up to $10,000 monthly sales. It could be 3% per transaction. They're all different. PayPal's... Mm -hmm. I have to look up the, the most current value, but PayPal is probably around 2.3 or 2.5 percent per transaction, which if you do the math, it adds up, but everyone has to deal with this. If you already have your own business, you, you already know about dealing with payment processors. So this gold cart gives you all of these features as well as the ability, if you've already got Authorize.net, for example, you probably want to integrate your store your online store with your authorized.net account that you already have. So this requires the gold cart, and the gold cart appears to be on sale at the moment for $99. Regular price $199. Again, not everyone's going to need this, so great, you're going to save $200.
Gold Cart is recommended for smaller businesses that are comfortable using WordPress and for users that feel comfortable installing plugins, which we should all be relatively. Developers with less WordPress experience who feel they may need additional support should consider purchasing Gold Cart plugin for developers. Oh, that's interesting. Developers with less experience should purchase the developer version, which I would think that would be the opposite. Mm -hmm. What do you use it for on Eclipse Corporate? It's PayPal. Plain old PayPal. And that one is by default, and we haven't used right. Yeah, WP Commerce by default uses PayPal. And WooCommerce? WooCommerce can also use PayPal, I think, by default. Uh, but it also really promotes this other one. I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, it's this one down here. I just saw it. This is another very popular one. Mihire. Mijire. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that's another that's another uh, popular one. It's kind of kind of relatively new, but but getting gaining a lot of attention. There's another one called Stripe. That one's another up and coming one. But there's lots of ways to do this. But we're going to learn through PayPal because right out of the box it works pretty well for most people. So that was uh, that was here looking at the store upgrades. Let's go look at store sales, and at the moment there's not much to look at, but this is the screen where you would see in detail who your customers are, and their order, and all of that, and it'll show here the order status, how much they paid for, you can click and you'll see all the details. We don't have any sales or anything, so we see nothing here. But then this gets us to this issue here, where I asked at the beginning of, of this class, and I think I asked it last month too, and the question is, are you sure you want to become the next Amazon.com? Because as I said previously, when we buy something at Amazon, we go to the website, we buy something, we wait, we get the product. A lot happened in between buying and getting the product, even if it's a digital product. There was the, the middleman taking that money and taking their cut, moving it from your bank account to their bank account. There was, if it's a physical product, where was it stored? Who, uh, who packaged it? and mailed it and delivered it. We have to deal with all of that now. And we have to deal with customers' information. It's happened all the time, and it's going to keep happening, but all of these big companies are also getting hacked. Remember the Target hack last year after Black Friday? Remember the Home Depot hack? Uh, Bank of America, didn't they get hacked too? So all of these big companies are getting hacked, have gotten hacked. They may get hacked again, they may not, but now you're going to deal with people's information. You're not going to deal with, however, their credit card information at least. When someone buys something through your store, PayPal will take care of that. You will see you're going to buy a product and then it will go through the processing system and PayPal will actually take that uh, money and deposit it into your account and deal with the encryption and all of that. You, however, are still going to deal with these people's uh, home address and phone number and whatever you need to collect in order to send them a product. If you're selling digital products, you can maybe only ask for their email and their credit card. And PayPal is going to deal with the credit card, but you're still going to have a database full of email addresses. So if you're going to be shipping products, you're going to need their first name, last name, street address, phone number, all of that stuff. You're going to be storing it in your account. So I'll talk about it in more detail, but then that means you should really look into investing in something called SSL certificate. secure socket layer, a security certificate, basically. The SSL is what makes that little lock appear on websites. It's that little lock that you see that makes you safe when you go to a bank or when you go to Amazon and so forth. That's what makes the lock. Yes? Yes. 
nowadays really especially with merchants if they don't see that lock they're gonna get they're gonna be wary and the price is very wild. Yeah. what are some prices you've seen All right, under a hundred dollars yeah so this is not free this is something you're gonna buy from Bluehost or GoDaddy or Yahoo or whatever you're gonna buy it from your provider and it's gonna range I see that GoDaddy also has has uh, sales one year SSL certificate for free I see that sometimes and then regular price probably ninety dollars but it ranges seventy dollars ninety dollars a hundred and fifty two hundred it really ranges um, I would of course buy it with a reputable company like GoDaddy, Bluehost, HostMonster, etc. And we'll get into more detail about that later. You can research this on your own. But the point is that if you want your site to be more secure, if you want people to buy your products and see that lock, you need SSL. The good thing at least is they're going to buy your product, click pay now. Before they click pay now, they may never see the lock. But when they click pay now, you will then hand off the user to PayPal. And you better believe PayPal is going to have the best security. So up until the point where you're about to make a payment, your site might not have the, the lock. But then when it goes over to make payments on PayPal, it will have the lock. And it would be better that they see the lock through your whole process, but that will, will require that you purchase the certificate. Yes? Are you paying for the certificate like it's a one-time fee or like per? It's yearly. Do you have like a per sale? You know? Nope. They just uh, sell you this certificate, which is basically that these security companies are vouching for your company on a yearly basis, and then uh, you do some setup, and then your site will now have HTTPS colon slash slash victorsbakery.com. That's the security HTTPS. So if your site only has HTTP, no security and you get the S with the SSL certificate and you pay yearly. So the SSL certificate is very good uh, for having uh, for your customers to feel safe that they're making transactions. It's also good for your customers in that having an HTTPS connection means that also the traffic that goes from their computer to the server is encrypted that's the security part because plain old HTTPS sends all the information through the waves through the internet through the air naked credit card information is included if you don't have HTTPS once you've got security then the communication between the person's computer and your server is encrypted that's why you're paying $99 or more per year security so that's gonna help people not not get their information stolen However, that still doesn't protect you from someone guessing your password as an administrator to log into your account. Because there's many kinds of exploits, many kinds of hacks to get into a site. Uh, one is man in the middle, which is what the security certificate is supposed to protect. This hacker got in the middle between the user and your server. Well, with an SSL certificate, it helps minimize that. But that SSL certificate is not going to protect you from someone logging into your home page because you had a very weak password. So there's lots of pieces of this security puzzle. But one of the things you want to think about is investing in an SSL certificate and a good password. Because our password is currently password, which is a horrible password. But I hope not. But I use the capital I use the capital P, aren't I secure? <laughs> yes. I'll touch on it, but that's pretty technical. If there were a part three of this class, we would definitely talk much more about security and such. But I will touch on it and give out resources to look at yourself. Uh, but I will mention a couple of ways to make the site a, a little bit more secure. Not yet. When more people enroll and the, and, the, and the boss sees that there's a lot of people coming to class consistently, 
then eventually there might be a part three. But uh, I don't think there's a, a mo I don't think there's enough people at the moment to sustain three whole months yet. So um, this is what I'm saying about. Are you sure you want to be the next Amazon? Because now you're going to be storing people's information. Um, but what also we will see after we've got this plugin installed, we were looking at the dashboard screen. Um, there's a, a whole section we'll look at in, in detail later. But we've got products. If you hover over, you don't have to click it yet, but if you hover over products, we've got all of these things to, to work with. Our database of products will be listed there. We can add products, of course. We'll have tags and categories, very similar to blog posts, but these are attached to products. And these are also very useful to have, because when we use categories, that will allow us to have, for example, um, I've got Victor's Bakery, and I'm going to be selling a bunch of baked goods, and I'm going to have cupcakes and cookies and pies. So up on my menu, I could have a drop-down menu that says Shop, but then from the Shop menu, I can have cookies, cakes, pies. And I can show a particular category of product on a screen, just focusing on that product. And we'll see that that's when we do this under categories. Variations. Let's say I'm selling clothing. Men's clothing, women's clothing, kids' clothing. And let's say under kids' clothing, I have shirts. So kids might be small size, medium size, large size. Those are variations. I'm selling one particular shirt that has SpongeBob SquarePants, but it's got large, medium, small. Variations. So we'll be able to do that. That's what we've got going on in Texcoco. We saw that 10 ounce, 10 ounce tortilla soup, 20 ounce tortilla soup with different prices, of course, because the 21, 20 ounce is more expensive. It's more food. So we'll be able to do that, make variations of large, medium, and small, and different prices as well. So we can sell things as bundles. And of course, consumers love coupons, and we can use coupons effectively um, through this plugin via giving discounts with more sales. If you buy 10 of something, it's more affordable than if you buy 5 of them. Yes. For the images, uh, you say that was a picture, uh, like a camera picture. So, what is the, the size that you recommend to, for the images? For the images, um, it really depends on your product. But let me just give you some, just a quick note right here. Uh, a good size, good image size, is 1,000 pixels any dimension. So if you've got a wide picture, 1,000 pixels by whatever height. Uh, if you've got a tall picture, well, height, 1,000 by whatever width. And it's not too heavy? That is a good medium between high quality of a picture and download size. Because if you upload a picture that's, let's say, 200 pixels, it's going to be too small for the consumer to see but it depends on your product. For example, that jewelry site that I mentioned, I'll mention it again, elsavalencia.com, she wants to show a lot of detail of her product. She wants to show the detail of this beautiful 10 karat gold. A 200 size pixel picture is not going to look good for the consumers that she's trying to attract. So on hers, she does have, she does have um, large pictures. And there is that balance between high quality and download size. If, for example, we have that, see it's pretty big, you see a lot of detail, and you can also do the zoom in to see even more detail. So that's a big image. Is but that a plugin? That, when you zoom in? That is based on the theme, actually. This particular theme has that built in. We, can, we, have, uh, we have some ability to do the zoom in uh, with with our plugin here, but this one that I that is really cool. Uh, I know it comes with this theme, but it might be separate also. I'd have to look it up. Is that also WPP? This particular one is using um, uh, WooCommerce because she had started her site 
uh, a few years ago and she had started it in WooCommerce then she hired us and it was actually better to continue to use WooCommerce than to start over because as we'll talk about unfortunately it's hard to go from one plugin to another with e-commerce yes the theme is a very uh, very big aspect of how your store works and looks so this particular theme accepted large pictures very large pictures and then it had this built-in zoom other themes might accept a large picture but it's still only going to show you certain sizes because the theme is only capable of showing you certain sizes. Do they have a plugin? They do. Hmm. They, uh, they might not charge, but th these p Zoom plugins are available separately. This particular client with this particular theme had the Zoom feature built in. And we ha we'll see we have a version of Zoom, not as cool as this, but we have a version of Zoom built into what we currently have also. So, um, we were looking at uh, that we have on the products right here, coupons, and then extensions, so extra features, extra, extra features. Um, when we create products, we'll be looking at these items uh, a little later. So my handout. Okay, we've got the stuff in the dashboard, stuff in products. Let's look at pages. The way this actually works is through pages. Click on pages. And WP Commerce created four pages for us. A products page, page, a checkout page, a transaction results page, and then your account page. Great, I want to go see it. Let's go to visit site. problem. We have four pages, why can't I access them? We haven't added them to the menu. Exactly. We have not added those pages to the menu. Let's do that. Remind me, how do I get to edit my menus? Appearance. Appearance. Dashboard appearance menus. Or shortcut dashboard menus. So let's go to Appearance, and then Menus, and you're going to see here, Products page, Your Account, Transaction, Checkout, they're all right here, they're not in my menu yet, they're not in my main menu. So you want to select them, check marks, click the check mark on each of those there, Add to Menu, it will be part of my menu now. Notice, however, these are all on the same indention level. I want your account, transactions, and checkouts to, to appear below products page. I want to click the button to pop them out. So right now they're all on the same level. So remember, you can simply drag to the right a little bit to indent it. Now it's a sub-item. Drag the next one, but be careful because it often goes like that. Now that's a sub-item of a sub-item. Probably don't want that, so you just have to kind of wiggle it around to find it somewhere. There we go. Yes? So we've got those products pages and account pages and everything. And um, you want to remember to save your menu. On the top right, remember to click Save. And now let's visit site. Save menu, visit site. Products page. You click the little triangle 
or arrow, your account, transactions, check out. Click product page, no products. Click your account, no purchase history yet. Transaction results, no transactions, and check out, there's nothing in your cart. So we will be able to customize this, of course, because products page doesn't sound so friendly when I'm selling kids' toys or baked goods and such. We'll see that we can edit this to say the shop or shop now or whatever we want. And these things can also be renamed. We don't have a lot of uh, a lot of customization for what's visible on the screen because it just works out of the box so we're not going to see perhaps a menu item that says edit shopping cart screen but we will see that we always have the ability to customize anything we want in WordPress if we edit some code so WordPress will always let us pull back the curtain and edit code that requires however that you have a little bit of experience in editing HTML or CSS code and we'll touch on it but out of the box, we're going to get some pretty good results. And what we're like, I'm showing you what we're seeing in some of these clients. This is all out of the box. This is W. This is WooCommerce, yes, but it's the same. A lot of the dis the way it looks is just the theme. How it functions behind the scenes, it works very similar. WooCommerce, WP Commerce, Texcoco, the Mexican food restaurant. That one is all just WP Commerce right out of the box, basically. Back to my dashboard. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can you just uh, mm -hmm. stop me for a second? How do you go to the product page? How do you go to the products page? Yeah, because when, when, when I click on it, I see home, but you see the product page. I see, yes, I said, yeah. Did um, you click on it? Because there's the triangle I, and then yes. there's also the name. Did you click the name? I click on it, on it and the same not found. Most likely, you didn't set your rewrite module. Remember on your instructions of uh, sheet number four, at the very last item is the rewrite module. So we'll, we'll look. We'll see that there's not much really to edit on a particular page itself of the cart. All of this is just kind of works. It works behind the scenes but we will be able to do some edits. Yes? Yes. So if you have the plugin, this is a good one to look into. We'll talk about it in more detail called Visual Composer. The Visual Composer plugin will let us design our pages a lot better than the built-in WordPress than this basic thing here, right? We all, we've only got bold and italics and basic stuff. But if you look into a plugin called Visual Composer, suddenly you'll have many more options like columns and video drop-ins and all of this cool stuff. We'll look at it later, but Visual Composer. Stuff. Yeah, that would be a conflict because if I'm writing code, if I'm, if I'm writing the raw code, but then I'm using a plugin that's supposed to do it for me, yeah, your Visual Composer might overwrite your changes because it's trying to do what you're doing manually. It's trying to do automatically what you're trying to do manually. So maybe there are several plugins with Visual Composer. That's why I said we'll come back to it later. The, uh, the next item, which we'll spend a lot of time looking at, but really only once, are the settings. The settings of my store. Because right now, technically it works, and we can start adding products, but there's a lot of settings that we should look at first. That's what we're spending today and next time on, the, on, on a lot of this stuff. So, my last item here, under Settings, Store. Settings menu, Store. Go ahead and click there. And then we get, we get this screen with a bunch of tabs. And we're going to look at all the tabs. 
starting with this general one. So these are general options all about your store. Base, country, and region. Select your primary business location. So it's alphabetical. I'm going to select USA, unless you're selling elsewhere, but this is where your primary location is located. Your primary store is located. State, probably California, unless you're a Delaware limited liability company and all of those tax tricks that a lot of people don't know about. So USA, California. And this gets us into the issue, well, okay, I'm about to make an e-commerce store. Do I need to have a business license? And do I need to have a merchant account at my bank? And all of that? Uh, yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes, if we speak with small business owners. Um, another answer is depends. Depends what you're trying to do because you might be able to get away with doing what you need out of the most basic options but I can I'm not a tax person there's at least one person in this room that might help you with taxes if you ask and um, the thing about all of this is that it can be complicated that's why there's professionals that deal with taxes and all of that stuff and so I can really only give you experiences of what myself or my company have done and for the clients that I've worked with, it really is much more beneficial to go through the process of getting a business license and getting a merchant account and all of that official stuff because ultimately it all comes down to your taxes. Are you right with Uncle Sam with all of your taxes? And so if you have all of this set up as, as legitimately as possible, you'll be better off. But technically, you, if you decide, I'm going to form a company, I've got a website and I've got a PayPal, you're a company you can sell products but all of that tax detail is why we might hire professionals and I'm not a professional when it comes to that I can just tell you what what we've done for clients based on their tax professional information and so ideally you know you can go down to City Hall and pay like $45 or something for a cheaper than that. So like 35 40 $35 to get a business license. You'll be an official business and have it for like five years, a five-year business license. $35. You'll have an official business license. It's every year. Every year, okay. Tax ID number and all of that good stuff. So, again, are you sure you want to be the next Amazon? So now you're going to deal with all of this. Target markets, where are you selling to? Right now, all the countries basically and territories of the world are selected, but really, you might not really want to, to sell t uh, to Andorra. You might not know that they are a country between France and Spain. There is. There's a country between France and Spain. Look at a map. But um, I'm going to say my company, as an example, is only selling in the U.S. So what I would say is click None to turn off all the countries, and then go down to USA and activate USA. Obviously, if you're selling other places, check what you need to sell. Maybe you're selling to USA, Canada, and Mexico. Great, turn them all on. But if you say you're also selling to Ukraine, if you didn't turn that off and someone trying to buy from Ukraine, be prepared to ship something very expensively. Have you ever gone to a store online and you add something to your cart and you're about to click buy, but then you say, maybe I should pay the mortgage this month instead. So then you don't buy it. And you come back next payday and the item is still in your cart. That's this here. Keep stock in cart for how long? And then right now it says one day and you have to decide what will work for you. Because if a person, if you put in here, let someone keep this in their cart seven days, that now kind of took it away from everyone else that wants to buy it at that moment, and this person eventually ends up not buying it. So you had an item out of stock, but that was in the warehouse for seven days that was never bought. So you can decide what to put here. I can't tell you, but you've got hours, days, and weeks, and you can do fractions. You've got a very hot product, you can do one hour in stock. And then it goes back into the pool.
don't worry about this hierarchical thing. It's good. Don't worry about it. Currency type. Uh, we're accepting dollars, but not New Zealand dollars. You might want to change that. So this is a, also a cold screen here to... What's that? United States dollars. Yeah, USD. United States dollars. Yes, uh, I'm not USA and then I mean, you say US dollar. Yeah, US dollar. Oh, it's mm -hmm. So this is a nice screen to look at also so you can learn the currencies of the world. Now you know that the Turkey uses the lira and Tunisia uses the dinar and Ukraine uses the krivnia. Currency sign, uh, you can change that, it has no meaning, but if you're international, sometimes they use the currency symbol at the end of the monetary unit, or they use the correct way types. Thousands and decimal places, again, you can change that if you'd like, or you can use the correct way. Save changes. What's the difference between the third one and the fourth one? I mean, I'm not seeing any, anything different. I mean, currency sign. There's a space. Oh. There's a space. I guess that has importance for some currencies. Just like these two right here, they have got a space at the beginning. Right there. So if you made any changes here, and most likely you did, remember to click Save Changes. Let's look at the admin panel at the top. How many of you are planning on selling virtual products, which include ebooks, mp3s, graphics, any virtual products? And what about like seminars and audio things? If you're selling any virtual products, we will be able to sell them through this plugin, of course. And here then you can decide, this will apply to you. If you're not selling virtual products, you might not really need to care about these, these items here. Max downloads per file. Let's say you're selling ebooks, you're selling a PDF. The default is you have one download. If the person downloads it, their computer blows up, and then they lost that file, they'll have to buy your book again. If you have here a more judicious um, three downloads, then let's say for whatever re reason they lost their first PDF, and then the second one they lost it also, and then they have a third time to download. Then if they want to download it again, now you have to pay. But really, with digital files, a person might download one copy of it, and I can make 10 copies in 5 seconds. I can make 100 copies in 10 seconds. So this is really more for the people that want to download the original one that are not tech savvy enough to make a copy of their own files, which most people are probably. So whatever you'd like to do there, and if you're a digital product, you definitely want to think about what to put there. <coughs> Lock download IP. Is there a plugin that prevents people to reproduce any digital information? Not really. Um, anything digital really is very, very difficult not to copy. You can steal just about anything digitally. The best that you can do is add watermarks and other such features. Because if I downloaded a file and I'm tech savvy enough, I can, I can break just about any copy protection and make as many copies as I want. So there's really no good way to save your or protect your stuff from unauthorized copying. Even with iTunes? Huh? For example, on iTunes, they had their music files. They don't use MP3s. By default, they use an Apple format. That Apple format is protected. But people figured out that if you download that Apple song, burn it to a CD, and re-rip your CD, now you've got an unprotected file. So there's no way to protect your stuff, really. You want to put in watermarks and such to your, to your files. Um, you know, if it's, got a, if it's a sound file, maybe in the middle of the sound or somewhere, put in some sort of audio cue, some sort of audio copyright or something. Uh, and then at least that file will have it listed that it's got it came from a certain location. So lock downloads to IP. I would recommend to leave this on no.
because what this does is let's say I went to my friend's house and I downloaded your PDF on how to make money fast and I went back to my house and I don't have the file so if I try to download it again even though if we put in here 10 downloads but I went back to my house and I tried to download it it won't let me because if I turned on lock IP address that's your internet protocol address and everyone's got a different one so if I go to my friend's house he's got a certain address on the internet if I go to my house I've got a different address so if I say only let people download the file from the original download then they'll never be able to download it from their home computer and I still wouldn't do that because most of us that have, let's say, AT&T, UVerse, or Cox at home, or whatever, the, those companies change our IP addresses anyway, every few months or years or whatever. So it's up to the providers. They're going to change your address. It's not, it's not that you're going to have the same address your whole life. On the internet, you're going to have a new address every once in a while. So if you lock that down to yes, your people are not going to be able to download your file again, even though they legitimately bought it, and even though they still have five legitimate downloads. So that one I don't recommend to put on yes. Don't worry about this MIME type. Store admin email. This is the email that you're going to get notified at when the sale is made when a return is initiated and all of that stuff. So you can change it and this can actually be different than the default WordPress administrator which is up on general. See we've got an administrator of WordPress in general. We've got an administrator of your store in admin. So those can be different. Terms and conditions is very useful um, because if you're selling a product as is or maybe you're selling with no returns, you want to list that for people. And the cool thing is that once you activate that, a person will not be able to fully buy the product until they click on, I have read the terms and conditions. And even if they didn't read it, you're still covered legally. They had to turn on the check mark where they agreed, I read it. And then when they come back to you and say, why did you sell me this product? You say, you, you agreed to the terms and conditions. And, you said, and they say, I never read it. You agreed to the terms and conditions. Case closed. So terms and conditions really vary. If you look at Elsa's site, add to cart, proceed to checkout, Right here, I have read and accepted the terms and conditions. What are the terms and conditions? As much as as much as you want. It could be Elsa grew up this and that. These products are once in a lifetime, and so forth. Question. Okay, clients have to have a PayPal account in order to buy. No, the person buying does not need a PayPal account. They can use a regular debit credit card, PayPal, whatever. It's just that PayPal is going to process the payment. That's how it used to be before, PayPal? I think so, a while ago. They wanted everyone to create an account, yeah. but now you need to, now you don't need to. You can use a regular credit card, yeah. debit card. So what I would say is if you don't know what to write in here, and I recommend you write something, and I can't tell you what to write because it depends on your company, I would look up here terms and conditions generator and you're gonna find companies that do it for free and companies that do it not for free but uh, this is a uh, to various degrees legally binding um, at the very least for most people it will be enough if you need many more detailed terms and conditions there's plenty of lawyers that will help you with that. But to get started, you could look up terms and conditions generators or terms and conditions template. And you can be very specific for small business, for websites, for e commerce, for raffles, for nonprofits. So I would strongly suggest you do that.
just to put something in, this is Victor's Bakery, so we will say, um, what's that one warning that all of these, all this food has nowadays? Um, created in a facility that also processes, uh, well, they often say nuts, tree nuts. I saw tree nuts, just nuts. So allergy, allergy disclaimer. So you're not gonna you're not gonna then sue us once you eat our delicious pecan sandies, even though you've got a nut allergy. Because pecans are nuts, I think, or legumes or something. So here we've got that, and they agreed to it before they can purchase. This can be as long or as short as you need. People will get a receipt when they buy your product, of course, like a real store. So here you can set up what's the, ad what's the address it's coming from and what's the sender's name. So as an example for my site, we can do this. We can do no reply at victorsbakery.com. This is not creating a new address called no reply at Victor's Bakery. This assumes the one already exists. So I could also have Victor's Bakery at gmail.com. Obviously, I need to go to Gmail to create that account. But you often see this, don't you? No reply at something. And in theory, no one is supposed to reply to that. So technically, you can make this up and not even be a real address because you're not going to check replies. That's what, it's, that's what it says. But if you really have your own domain, victorsbakery.com, that I bought at, at Bluehost, I could create no reply at victorsbakery.com, and I could get emails in there, and maybe I will deal with replying, them, replying to them. That's up to you. And this came from Victor's Bakery Shop or, I don't know, order, fulfillment, or whatever you want. Is that how you spell fulfillment? Fulfillment. Victor's Bakery Orders. And the message that the person will get via email is right here, which of course you can change. It's just plain text. Thank you for purchasing with and then your shop name will be added automatically. Any items to be shipped will be processed as soon as possible. Any items that can be downloaded, etc., etc. I'm not going to be selling any downloadable cupcakes, so that doesn't make sense for me. So I can change that. And then the person will get a, uh, will get a, a, a receipt that has the list of products they bought, a total shipping, and a total price. You don't have much control over what that looks like, but you do have some control of what to, what to show. Right here, do you see it says customer purchase receipt? You can use the purchase, you can show the purchase ID, shop name, product list, total price, total shipping, a question about where did you find us, uh, so you can get some traffic stats and also the total tax. But that's only fixed though, right? You cannot change it. Yeah, we can't change exactly what it looks like. It's very basic what it looks like, but you wouldn't really need a very fancy looking receipt. It goes out like a regular email, yes. And there's a spot that should make sense about, uh, well, uh, tracking information. So you can change that. Looks good. Click Save to save any changes. Let's look at taxes. Here, I won't be able to... to tell you very much here. This really is up to you to decide what to do here. By default, taxes is off. 
But to use taxes, you simply turn on tax. So I need to show you this. I'm going to turn on tax and then click save because then this, this will then activate, which is how much am I charging for tax. So if you are going to charge tax, you now you have a whole other thing to talk to your professionals about. How are you going to tax? And most of these details that are here should be just fine. The big thing is, are you going to tax yes or no? And what's your rate? Because then you've got here tax rates. For all markets, I'm going to charge a flat 8%. I can charge tax also to the shipping. Or I can say, okay, it'll be 8% for USA, California. On the right side, there's a little plus sign, so I can add another tax rate and then say, USA, I don't know, New York. Anyone know the tax rate in New York? Let's say 7%. So look at that. You can be very specific. You can add different tax rates for different locations. Obviously, this would be a lot of work for a lot of different states. This is one of the features, this is one of the spots, unfortunately, that the WP Commerce is not as powerful as it could be. Because we know, especially, well, even here in California, most of Cali uh, most most of San Diego is eight percent tax rate, but you go over to National City and they're nine percent within the same county. So tax the tax rate thing is crazy throughout the U.S. So maybe if you just have it a flat eight percent everywhere, while well, you're overcharging some places and you're undercharging other places. Again, talk to your tax professional what to do here. All I can really talk about is do you want to use taxes or not? So the, the tax depends on where the buyers come from. Well, you can change that right here. Tax logic. Mm -hmm. Apply tax when billing is the same as your tax rate. Apply tax when the shipping is the same as tax rate. Or apply when they're both the same or when it's... Th so you've got a little bit of setup to do there. And then again, some states charge you if you are buying from the same state. And some states charge, if you're on a different state, it's tricky. And California is one of the ones that I think charges you both. If you're in Florida and buying in California, you could still be charged California tax as well as Florida tax. Or let's say I'm in Nevada buying Florida. Well, I'm in Nevada, so I don't get charged Florida tax. But if you, if you, if you sell a product that's not a physical product, but a, you know, online video or ebook. Yeah. Again, I'm not a professional with this. Exactly. I think the way I view it is you're buying it in your location. And so you've got a truck like if I sell something off my website in San Diego to somebody in Alaska, let's say I'll be sold it in my store. You know, I sold it. And then usually like the way California works is on your income tax return, you're supposed to report anything you bought out of state that you didn't pay sales tax. You're supposed to do that. And everybody thinks, ah, who in their right mind to do that? Well, they're working on that. So you do the same for an international buyer? Like somebody in Mexico buys your software? Uh, yeah, because they're buying it from you. Right. You know, they're, it's like if a guy from Mexico comes across the border and walks in your store and buys something. Right. They'll pay that. sales tax if he buys off your website. Okay. That's that I believe that's the way it is and it could vary from state to state, but you know, either way you're supposed to So you collect that money and then you get the same work. So you see it's a complicated thing. And as luck would have it, we have a tax professional in the class, so if you might want to meet up with him after class. I'm not real heavy in sales tax. I <laughs> really don't have a lot to do with income tax and income tax but I do have yeah, we, we just collect sales tax at 8% like in San Diego, not in the state of New York, Florida, Florida. Okay. That's just what they do. What do you sell? Um,
For us, uh, like the for that uh, Mexican food place, they've got a location here in San Diego and one also in Los Angeles. So we do have the two tax brackets there, the tax rates, one for San Diego tax and one for Los Angeles tax. And that seems to be working pretty well for them. So really think about it in terms of where are you selling from. And most of us are probably here in San Diego, so we're probably going to be collecting San Diego tax. Now, are you based in National City, which is 9%, or are you based in L.A., which might be 8.25, or so forth? One of the things that our, our website, if somebody orders something from us in their National City, our website calculates the National City, but we go in and adjust it to San Diego. Mm -hmm. Tricky. Yes. Well, this looks like I need to hear limitations because it's e-commerce package as opposed to any other because you're only limited to California or the metro. Yeah. Um, exactly. This this might be this might be that. Um, I think the the closest that you can do for that is then you do some you do some, you jump some hoops with tax bands. Tax bands do allow you to fine tune it as deep as, as the locality. On that one, you would create something that would be like National City of the Market USA. All markets, because that's still going to tell you states and then we can put in there 9%. And then when we create the product, we will attach that tax band to a particular product. So it is doable that you can be very specific, but again, that's why it's off by default, because this is complicated. You need to talk with your particular professionals. But at the very least, we can charge by state, by, by country, and if we really want to get detailed with tax bands, not everyone's going to need this, obviously. That's why I kind of zoomed the bias, but you can make tax bands, and later on we'll see, we can attach a band to a product, and it'll be governed by that tax structure. Getting hey, back to that, I think they just, because they just recently did legislation, and maybe you're correct on that, I think the way it's been is, if somebody from New Jersey buys something from New Jersey, they weren't talking about sales tax, because they were required to report that sales tax, but I think... Didn't Amazon just get popular? They have yeah. to sales tax. That was the big thing. Uh, this has been a few years in coming. It used to be you would get charged no sales tax about almost any online realtor. Yeah. And then probably like three or four years ago, it started to be rumbling that we're going to start charging you Amazon. And of course, Amazon fought back. They didn't, they didn't win that battle. It looks like maybe another one happened much more recently. But yeah, everyone's charging sales tax on the internet now because that's a source of revenue. I am seeing it. Definitely, I'm seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. And and Amazon does. Yeah. So they might have like they might have you know the those tax havens of Utah or Delaware. They might be set up there to avoid some of these things, but. You know, the, these loopholes are being closed. What's that? Hmm. So, yeah, it's a complicated thing. That's why I can really only show you here's the place to set it up, and then you have to figure out how to set it up. But then, really, uh, I can only tell you from experience of my client, you know, uh, Elsa, for example, she has the flat rate of California, but uh, Texcoco has the, has the multiple ones of, of uh, California and uh, Los Angeles and San Diego based on tax bans. So it just takes more effort to set up and it can be obviously much more tricky and maybe other plugins or other uh, other plugins might give you much better control over this, but for most of us this might be a good solution just overall. Yes? Yes, I do have a client that may have some variation of how they want to set up their CPA or their um, expert to look at it, or is that on you? 
No, it would be on them because our service to provide to this client based on the contract that we wrote was to do their website, their social media, their web marketing and setup of e-commerce and such. But we have a clause that's saying we are not tax professionals. We are not professionals in that, in that aspect. You still need to check with your professionals and comply with your laws and we'll set it up based on your direction. So we are absolved of doing that because that's not our profession. If you've got questions about it, call the state board of equalization. The state board of equalization. Not, yeah, the state board of equalization. That's what you guys so well so far. State. Well, are there a lot of CPAs in the state that know about this? Why does that? Well, they have their own board of equalization. That's not a, that's not an income tax. That's a sales tax. Sales. Totally separate. State Board of Equalization, boe.ca.gov. Most likely, most likely this is small business, you know, small business classes and such. Any final questions before we move on from this scary screen? <laughs> Let's look at another scary screen. Shipping. Then we'll take a break. Shipping. This is another thing now you have to deal with, especially if you're physi sending physical products. If you're dealing with digital products, this has very little use to you. But if I am shipping real widgets to people across the US or the world, uh, I need to deal with shipping. So this one's on by default, but you can turn it off. What's your origin, name of the city where you fulfill and ship your orders from? Uh, that way the customer can get an accurate price of how much is it going to cost for it to get from your warehouse to their house. So let's say I put in San Diego and the zip code, 92123. There is something called Shipwire, which is not free, but this is to have warehouses. Instead of you having your boxes and boxes of products in your garage, you can have an account at Shipwire where you store your stuff there and then they will ship it out. It's not free and it can be very expensive because again, are you sure you want to be the next Amazon? Because it costs money to ship stuff throughout the US and the world. So if you do have a Shipwire account, you can activate that and get connected. You can set up shipping discounts and such, like free shipping. Once, it's, uh, once you've added a shipping city and zip code, then you get these options, okay, how are you setting up your actual shipping? And these are some built-in ones, flat rate, table rate, weight rate. So the flat rate is often going to be the, the most hassle-free, but it might not be the most affordable. Um, the post office, if you go to the good old post office, they will give you free shipping boxes. You just have to pay for the actual shipping. So you can get you can get a bunch of free boxes to put all your your items in there. Uh, you will have to still pay for the stamp and such. But then the post office also to be competitive, they they do pickups. You can uh, schedule right on the website or maybe even just leave it on your mailbox and the letter carrier when they drop off your mail they'll pick up your package right there. Uh, if it's all properly filled out. You might have heard of stamps.com. You can go there and get an account and get a bunch of shipping supplies and, and all of that, but you can go to the plain old post office com and uh, set it all up there and you can run a, a shipping empire right from your right from your garage. Um, you're going to need to still go in here and set some options. Flat rate, for example, well, to the continental US, uh, it's a flat rate of, let's say, $4. Because it might be $3 to ship here and it might be $7 to ship there. Well, that's going to require more setup with weight, with the weight, or the table. But let's say just for the for my peace of mind, overall in general, it's going to cost me four dollars. And then for the, all fifty states, Alaska and Hawaii, uh, well, I'll just bump that up to six. And what about the rest of the world? Well, maybe I am shipping to Europe, so that'll be twelve dollars. There's those are flat rates that are going to be added on top of whatever anyone buys, which might be very expensive if your product is on average three dollars each 
$12 shipping, well, like 90% of that cost went over just to shipping, which is, which is accurate. If you don't want to be flat rate, you'll have to get into table rates and such, such as, well, if the price of something is above $20, then the shipping is going to be $5. But if it's above $5, less than $20, then it's going to be $2 shipping. And all of this voodoo that you'll have to do in order for this to work properly. So it depends uh, on the product. Exactly, yeah. So here, that's why there's those ranges of $20, $50, whatever increments you want to do, and this can be rather detailed but annoying and time-consuming to set up, but once at least. You set it up once and then it'll work after that. And then you've got, of course, wait. There's a, there's a lady that asked me a few years ago about setting up a website to ship her paintings, and I didn't, I didn't get into that project because it was just the shipping and, and all of that was just really going to be complicated because her paintings were huge. Her paintings were like as big as these boards. Think about shipping this across the U.S. with proper padding and everything. Just on the shipping itself, she was saying it looks like it's going to cost me over $100 just to ship. And she's, sending, and she's selling her paintings, you know, $500. So this is another complication. But if you look, if you call up or go to the post office or FedEx or UPS or DHL or all of these shipping companies, that's what they're there for. They're going to ship your stuff, not for free, of course. But you get in contact with them and help you figure all of this out, what the best is for you. Um, for example, Texcoco. This isn't even a concern because the products are not shipped. These food items are bought online, but they're picked up by the person at the store. Elsa's products, the... Uh, the uh, the jewelry that one is shipped and I believe she's doing flat rate I don't re remember what the flat rate value was but she's going flat rate because her products are already pricey enough to cover whatever um, flat rate might be over or undercharged I think I saw it over here somewhere where did I see it right there enable free shipping discount for example sales over 20 bucks free shipping and I think you can do free shipping other ways flat rate you can do free shipping in a way like this also to the 48 states zero and then to the 50 states five so there's lots of ways to do this I can't tell you what to do. This is out of my scope. And then over here we can set up UPS or United States Post Postal Service. You can set this up for it to for people to fully be able to choose all of these options. What about a first class shipping? What about Priority Express? So we if you set up an account at USPS or UPS you set up an account and you set up these options here, then the people will have even more options to ship. Envelopes, in parcel, letters, etc. So I can't get into detail here. You need to figure it out. Talk to professionals. Shortest answer is probably flat rate will be okay, but sometimes you'll be overcharging and sometimes you'll be undercharging. There, there is. If you set up the account with, with USPS, well, it'll integrate. UPS. They all have it. UPS also, but um, I'm just saying as an example, the post office, the USPS, they've all got a shipping, a tracking number nowadays. You usually get it online. You you do have to have some setup online. You go on the website, you fill in a few things on the website, and it'll print out, and it'll send you an email, and it'll print out the packing label. You put that in the box, you give it to your letter carrier, and they take it off because it's ready. Okay, one last thing, then we'll take a break because uh, you'll just mention it briefly right now. We'll do it deeper later. Payments. This is how you collect payment. This is how you 
This is how you see that it's all worth it. Uh, so there's some built-in payment methods. The one that we will be looking at together is... I always forget which one it is. Oh, PayPal Payments Standard. This is very cool because all you need is to go to paypal.com, create an account, a business account. Not the big expensive, um, you know, not the big expensive version of the business account, just the regular business account. And it gives you a box here to put in your email. This is the email that I used to set up PayPal. And if you didn't know, PayPal has it set up so that when someone sends money to your email address and you've got a PayPal account, you'll get money. Well, for us here, you put in your email address of your PayPal account that you'll create, that we'll look at creating later. You put in your email address, click Save, and that's it. You're ready to accept payments. PayPal, of course, is going to take their cut, which is like 2.5% or something, which, you know, if you're spending, if you're selling things for hundreds of dollars, it adds up. And even for small amounts, it adds up, but there's always someone in the middle when it comes to money, and they're always taking their cut. The only way to avoid that, really, is if you're selling things on the street corner. Then you're the only person dealing with that money until you get to taxes April 15th, right? So, we're going to do a uh, we're going to do a quick break at this point just to catch our breaths, and then um, when we come back, we'll look at more of these settings. But take a look at this, and the one you want to make a note of is PayPal Payment Standard 2.0. What is the difference? Let's take a break, and I'll answer that. <laughs> Let's take a break, and I'll answer that. So it's 3:05. We'll be back at 3 uh, 3:15.